cover that. We'll be doing that in about five minutes. We're going to be doing a Q&A session with Elon in just five minutes. Please stick around. Not really sure why they didn't just do that after the presentation ended, but all right. Yeah, Elon has a... He hasn't had the good experience with Q&A sessions. <laughs> He's run off somewhere. He's probably hiding under the uh, under the starship under there. While we try to track down Elon, please enjoy the close-up shots of our quickly and honestly shoddily welded together Starship prototype. Turn the mic off now. Turn it back on when he comes back.
Uh, I see an Elon. Oh yeah, uh, any questions? <laughs> so, yeah. Where's Tim? Hi, hi Elon, Irene Plotz with Aviation. We, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you for the overview. Oh, I see Tim, um, he's right there. Can you tell us a little bit more details about the flight test program for this and the Mark II? Actually, can and we just talk, turn the music off? I can't quite hear because there's music playing. Oh, what, no, what, sorry. what music? Yes, okay. thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more details about the flight test program for both this Mark One and the Mark II vehicle in Florida and um, what the progression is to get to orbital flight and then a test flight? Asking the real questions. With the full vehicle. Uh, sure. Uh, Thanks. So, yep. Um, with, with any uh, development into uncharted territory, it is difficult to predict these things with precision. But um, I do think things are going to move very fast. Um, so our plan is in, in basically one to two months to do the, the 20 kilometer or 65 foot flight. Um, 65 foot, no 65,000 foot. Our next flight after that might actually just be all the way to orbit with a booster and the ship. Um, uh huh. Most uh, right. I'm, I'm giving you just literally stream of consciousness here. Most likely, most likely we would not fly to orbit with Mach One, but we would fly to orbit with Mach Three, which will be built after Mach One right here. In fact, we'll start building it in about a month. So, yeah. Um, um, and, and actually, um, so sorry to say this mid question, but uh, I, I did want to make sure to uh, thank Yusaku Mizawa for his great support. Um, yeah, he's awesome. Uh, Yusak2020, that's his handle. That's a great handle. Um, anyway, he's a super cool dude, and he's like, you know, put, putting a lot of serious resources to helping out uh, Starship, so I want to thank him very much for that. Um, the. Uh, Anyway, so, yeah, just to frame things, we are going to be building ships and boosters at both Boca and the Cape as fast as we can. Um, and, and, and each successive, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be really nutty to see a bunch of these things. I mean, not just one, but a whole stack of them. Um, and we're improving both the design and the manufacturing method um, exponentially. So, for example, um, with the current way that we built this, this or the way that Mach 1 and Mach 2 cylindrical sections were built uh, was in, um, with, with basically plates. So a series of plates to create each cylinder section. With uh, Mach 3 and beyond, we will literally take the coil of steel from the mill, unspool it, uh, change the curvature to a nine meter diameter, and do a single seam weld. Um, and it would also be thinner. All right, good. Which makes it lighter and cheaper. Um, so That's better than we're welding, welding all these little panels to together. Quite crazy by space standards. Um, I think we'll probably have Mach 2 built within a couple of months or, or less, and Mach 3, maybe three months, that type of thing. Um, Mach 4, four months, maybe five months. And we would seek to go to orbit with probably Mach 4 or Mach 5. So we would, I mean, this is going to sound totally nuts, but I think we want to try to reach orbit in less than six months. Right. So, 12 months from now. Pro pro provided the rate, the rate of, tech, uh, of design improvement and manufacturing improvement continues to be exponential, I think that is, uh, you know, accurate to within a few months. Yeah. Hi, Elon. My name is Steve Clark. I'm with the Brownsville Herald. 
Okay. Back in September 2014 at the groundbreaking, you said that the first crewed interplanetary mission could possibly leave. Yes. Can you hear me? Could possibly leave from Boca Chica. Do you think that's still the case? Yes, that, that is, I, I think, definitely possible that the first uh, crewed mission on Starship could leave from uh, Boca. Um, the, we actually are, are internally competing um, the Cape, Cape, the Cape, and and Boca. Um, so, I think I think both will both places will, as, as to the best of my knowledge, both places will launch uh, crewed missions. Um, so, I think it is extremely likely that we will launch crewed missions from Boca, um, and there is a at least a fifty percent chance that it is the first mission. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, Elon, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Hey, How are you? Good. Hi, good. Tim. Yeah. You have great questions online. Thanks. You have yeah. great answers. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so uh, that belly flop to tail down maneuver, I yeah. mean, that's something to see. Is that first one, this one right here, you know, 20 kilometers, is it going to come in that hot and do that, that flip that fast yeah. right here, or is it going to be out on the drone ship? Like, that's no, it's, gonna, it's basically right where Hopper took off. That's basically where it's going to take off. You know, within, you know, very close to where, 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 it's just right over there, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it, that maneuver that you see, you saw, it will execute now. Um, with, you know, when we get to, I think maybe Mark three, certainly Mark four, I think probably the, the, that will be a good time to transition to um, hot, hot gas thrusters from cold gas thrusters. So um, uh, using, Essentially, uh, compressed nitrogen uh, gas as the cold gas thruster is a pretty low ISP. You know, sort of 60, 70 if you're very lucky, but very closer to 60. Um, with um, with a, a methox thruster, you can get without really even trying hard 300 ISP. Um, mm. Even if you just film cool the walls without even regen cooling. Um, if you if you regen cool it, 350 no problem. 360 even. So you're talking about something that's the, then uh, five or six times the uh, mass efficiency of the, the nitrogen thrusters that are on Mach 1. Um, and w if you have thrusters of, of, of that efficiency, then uh, we don't need to use, uh, um, use the raptors to, to correct the uh, horizontal velocity. Because right, right now it's actually, uh, w w when, it, when the raptors fire, the raptors kick it, up, kick it over, but, but, but they they're actually accelerate the vehicle in the wrong direction then they have to overcorrect and then come back. Um, whereas if you have strong enough thrusters, you can just, uh, using the, the onboard um, maneuvering thrusters without lighting the main engines, you can just go kick it hard, light the engine, land. That'd be, uh, you know, that's better. Yeah. yeah. And then the, are those pressure fed then, those? Yeah, locks yeah, yeah, those be uh, uh, just pressure fed, high, pr high pressure uh, uh, gas methox, and so you have a high pressure, uh, um, you know, CH4 bottle, high pressure O2 bottle. So essentially, what um, you're saying is, it's like a those, um, um don't, they don't care what attitude you're at. It's a me it's you a methane controlled, attitude, any, you know, any Gs, uh, any methane field rather uh, uh, version yeah. of the Super Draco yeah. engine. Yeah. Hi, Elon. I'm Tim Fernholtz from Quartz. Thanks so much for taking the time. You're welcome. Two questions, if I may. One, just technical, following up on the presentation. To do useful stuff in orbit, you're going to need the booster as well as the Starship, right? Yes. Uh, Starship ca ca cannot get to uh, Earth orbit without the booster. Um, but um, anywhere except Earth, pretty much. Well, not counting Venus. But <laughs> the, um, Venus is Mars pretty much identical. Actually, it would be uh, harder to get off of Venus than it would be to Earth. Or uh, or moon, the Earth. You can easily get a single stage from the surface of the moon all the way to, to, to the surface of Earth without a booster. Um, so that shows you how deep, like Earth has a deep gravity well and a thick atmosphere. Um, so, um, but, but definitely cannot, I mean, well, I mean, if we, if we really went crazy light, you could probably do single stage to orbit non-reusable with the ship. Um, but that would be pointless. Elon, I just wanted to ask uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine oh God. last night about this presentation. He's concerned, I guess, about enthusiasm uh, for SpaceX's various programs. I'm just curious if you have any comment or response to that. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, for sure, the, uh, from a SpaceX resource standpoint, um, our, uh, our resources are overwhelmingly on Falcon and Dragon. 
Um, but just to be clear, the, it was really quite a, a small percentage of SpaceX that uh, did this did, um, uh, Starship, you know. Um, less than 5% of the company, basically. Um, the, like, like the, the really hard part that requires a lot of resources is optimizing something past the initial prototype phase and bringing it into volume production. Um, so, yeah, to be clear, like the vast majority of our resources are on Dragon and Falcon, especially Crew Dragon. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Elon. Uh, Chris Gephardt with NASA Space Flight. Ah, Chris G. How, how do you guys going to be asking the good questions. Keeping the methane and oxygen inside the tanks from boiling off in any significant quantity during a multi-month interplanetary trip to Mars. And um, on a more Earth-rounded question, what's your contamination mitigation strategy since these things are being built outside in the... Chris G. asking the really good questions. Well, th th these are pretty far in the distance uh, uh, questions. These questions are relevant, but in the, in the future years. Um, the, ke keeping the, the, um, the landing propellants cold on the way to Mars is a lot easier than it may seem. Um, because you can essentially vacuum, uh, j just like you'd keep um, uh, pr pr uh, cryogenic propellant uh, stored on Earth for long periods of time, you vacuum jacket it. Um, we would essentially Make sense. Um, uh, have header tanks that are bigger than these header tanks um, uh, and, and, and vent them to, to vacuum. So you would just basically have a tank inside a tank with multi-layer insulation, um, and, and this way you can keep the things... They'll be inside the main fuel bottom. tanks. Uh, it requires very little energy to... You don't even really need to worry about boil-off. You could, you, could, you could apply some energy to cryo-cool it, uh, but you don't really need to... You'd have a tiny amount of boil-off. Um, you know, in, in, in vacuum, things are, things are kind of weird. They're not like on Earth because you have no uh, convective cooling, really, in zero G. Um, so you, you actually have, you, you, the, the sun side of your rocket is very hot, and the, the not sun side of your rocket is at three degrees Kelvin. So it's super cold. Um, so you just like keep your cold stuff on the cold side and the hot stuff on the hot side, and it's pretty, this is not a problem to manage. Um, you know, the, for the, the long-term stuff for sort of what's called contamination of Mars, you know, the, the planetary protection. I, I think this, this concern, for, first of all, we'll do everything we can to mitigate it, obviously. Um, and, but, but at the end of the day, if you're going to send people to Mars, that's a pretty big contaminant. You know? um, but I, I really don't think that uh, some Earth-based bacterium is going to be able to migrate much through Mars. The, the thing that makes Mars very difficult is that it is both cold and has high ultraviolet. So if it was either cold or ultraviolet, you could evolve to deal with it. But the, the cold slows down the metabolic processes, and, the, and then the ultraviolet shreds the, shreds the DNA. So you're cold and shredded. Uh, this is very difficult for things to exist on the surface of Mars. And that's why we have not found uh, any but not impossible. on the surface of Mars uh, to date. If there is any life, it'll be very deep underground, and I think very resilient. Yeah, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, it's, it's also worth noting that uh, over time, there have been um, meteors, there have been chunks of Earth that have been shipped off by meteors. Another part uh, of, of if I may Mars, and interrupt him, Mars uh, another part of planetary protection is making sure that we don't contaminate it and then mistake the contaminated, the uh, introduced uh, bacteria and things like that for life that, that already pre existed on Mars. Um, but I know your vision isn't maybe like a government We'd probably be able to tell a difference, terrible. but you never what know. Like um, a, a private we don't really want any false alarms, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, um, I mean, it, it will definitely get fancier than it currently is, you know, because the, 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 I actually the, missed the question. it's not fancier is, is, is just because it would have taken too long to build the buildings. So it, since it was going to take so long to build the buildings, we just built it outside. Um, yeah, it, this is like, um, my new thing is uh, management by rhyming. Uh, if the schedule's uh, long, it's wrong, and if it's tight, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. It works. Um, SR-71, you know, fastest plane in history ever, you know, it's also the coolest plane ever. Um, you know, it had uh, no anti-missile defenses except one, accelerate. Yeah, zero, 
Was, they try to shoot it down many times. Zero successes. Can you just give us a quick sense of what you think this area will look like in, say, 10 years when you are flying crews? I fail to oh, see what the like uh, SR-71 comparison had to do with anything, but stuff. all right. Um, <laughs> like, way, way more stuff than is currently here. Um, as you can tell, the wind is really quite vigorous. The, uh, like, one of the things that I think would be quite important to have locally is um, propellant production. So trucking massive, you know, thousands of tons of liquid oxygen to the site doesn't make a ton of sense. We should really produce the, ox the, the liquid oxygen here. Um, and by the way, it's not hard. Gaseous oxygen in the atmosphere. Just so cool the stuff in the air down. Separate um, it from the nitrogen oh, and the other stuff. One of the things over time um, is, uh, like for, for, for the prop propellant production on Mars, um, will be um, completely uh, renewable um, because we will use solar panels, um, pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Mars is a primarily CO2 atmosphere. Um, get the H2O, the water, from the ice. Mars has a, a, a massive amount of ice. You combine H2O uh, and CO2 and you get CH4 and O2. Um, this is a very uh, long understood process of run it over a ruthenium catalyst. Uh, this is a Sabatier process to create uh, CH4 and O2 out of uh, CO2 and, and H2O. Um, and that same system that we developed for Mars will long term be used on Earth. So long term, this is like, uh, long term we will produce the propellant for the rockets using solar power. Um, and pull the CO2 from Earth's atmosphere, use water, combine that into, into create CH4 and O2 on Earth. Um, and so the long term um, outcome will be quite sustainable and renewable for Earth and Mars. Jeff Faust of Space News. Jeff. Uh, this summer working with the FAA getting approval to do a single star hopper flight yeah. to 150 meters. Now you're talking about flying a much bigger vehicle to much higher altitudes and ultimately flying to orbit. Where are you in the FAA in terms of getting approval for that? And will those flight opportunities be able to coexist with, say, the, the local residents around here? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say um, the FAA Administrator for Space has been excellent to, uh, to work with. Uh, very forward-leaning. Um, um, really, is, I would just like to say thanks to the FAA for their support, actually. Um, I mean, really, there's, you know, uh, minimal delays related to regulatory activity, and, and they've been really very reasonable, and so, uh, you know, the support's very much appreciated. Um, so, you know, I think the FAA is, like, asks, uh, you know, good questions and uh, you know, wants to make sure things are safe, as do we. Um, and so we're going to make sure that uh, this, um, the risk to the public is extremely, you know, vanishingly small. Almost nothing, basically. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's the same sort of thing that we've had to, that we, that we deal with on Falcon 9 and Dragon. Um, and uh, it has gone very well, you know, for... The 17 years that SpaceX has been around, so, so you know, I think I feel pretty optimistic about things. Um, I, don't, I don't see any fundamental uh, obstacles. Um, we, we are working with uh, the the residents of Boca Chica Village because we think over time it's going to be quite disruptive to their to, to, to living in Boca Chica Village because it, it'll end up getting needing to get cleared for safety a lot of times, so I'd say probably not very, uh, you know, there would be just uh, not very comforting to the Boca Chica Village. It, I mean, I think the actual danger to Boca Chica Village is, is low, but it's not, it's not tiny. So therefore, I mean, we want super tiny risk. So you know, probably over time, better to um, buy out the, the villages. And, and we've made an offer to that effect, yeah. Which they rejected. Thank you, Elon. It's uh, Tarek Malik from Space.com. And I was curious, with the design update here, if a 100-person crew science for base uh, flights is still kind of the target now, and how the life support... Sorry, could you talk about ladders? The wind is, like, howling in my ear, unfortunately. Sure. Yes, uh, with the design update here, I'm curious if the 100-person crew size target is still the main target for uh, base crew flights and how the life support system for that is being developed for both the initial test flights, and then maybe for Mr. Miyazawa's flight uh, too in upcoming years. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think you, it really, I, I, I think you could still do 100 people. Um, it, like the, the, the pressurized volume on Starship is around 1,000 cubic meters. So if you had 100 people, you'd have 10 cubic meters per person, which is, you know, and, uh, especially in like a zero G situation, that's actually quite a lot of room. Unlike a 1G situation, you, you, you only get to use one surface, really, live on one surface in a 1G situation, but in a, in a zero G situation, you can live on, on six surfaces. You know, you can like all, all six sides of a cube. So um, things are way roomier um, than uh, they may seem. Um, and, and by the way, 1,000 cubic meters, I think, is close to what the space station pressurized volume is. So this, it's, it, you know, Starship is like... Uh, I think the space station has like 850 station, uh, cubic meters or something like that. Don't quote me. We can, make, we, we can make it bigger if as needed, you know. Um, yeah. He totally forgot about the life support question. Not sure if that was intentional um, or not. The Starship prototype here, Mark One. You talked a little bit about how you're going to build the super heavy vehicle. Can you update us a little bit more detail about how that development is going, where exactly it'll be built, um, and when we might see it on the on a on a test stand or on a pad? Uh, sure. Yeah. Good question. Um, so the priority is to build at least uh, two Starships at each site at Boca at the, and the Cape. Um, and then start building the booster. So um, we'll, we'll complete, um, you know, Mach one through four before doing Mach one of the booster, and then we'll do, um, you know, Mach one and Mach two of the boosters uh, at, at the Cape and and, and Boca. The the main constraint on 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 launching the booster is is um, Raptor production. Is engines, exactly. The booster has a lot of engines. So, uh, spooling up the Raptor production rate is extremely important to, uh, I mean, vital, obviously, essential to um, completing the booster. Uh, do, doing the, the, the tanks um, and the legs and, say, the grid fins, that is not a constraint. Like, that we can get done fast. Um, but we need, I think we'd, we'd The engines take time, because, you know, the... the 24 engines, but I think really at least 31 engines uh, to launch. So, 31 engines uh, for the um, you add that up, for the first stage, plus engines there, you know, six uh, engines for the second stage, for, for, for including three vacuum eight. engines. Well, these these have just have three. Mach one and two just have three three Raptor engines. Mach three and four will have six. So you add them. It's just like a lot of engines, basically, um, including development engines. Um, from now through through orbit, we probably need a hundred Raptor engines. Um, and our production rates right now is maybe one every sort of eight to ten days, um, and uh, but it should be one every couple of days in a few months. And then our, our target is to get to a Raptor engine every day by Q1 next year, or, or sooner. And if I may, when will, when will we see people flying on this vehicle into space? Well, I think we could potentially see people fly next year. You know, right? If we if we get to orbit in about six months, um, then and, and we have a remember we, it's designed to be a reusable rocket, so a reusable booster, re reusable ship, so we can we can do many flights to prove out the reliability very quickly. So whereas with an expendable vehicle, you have to build, if you want to do 10 flights, let's say, to prove out the viability of an expendable vehicle, you need to build and destroy 10 vehicles. Um, whereas we can do 10 flights, you know, it, within basically a 10 days. Um, so when I say rapid reusability, I mean, you know, you, you, you can fly it, you fly, you can fly the booster Keep in mind, this is all assuming absolutely zero day, setbacks or anything. Three or four times not That's losing not a not losing a vehicle, the only reason a ship of which they're time than that they're going to lose a vehicle. Is that you need a couple of, of you need, you need probably you this one. Orbits to synchronize for the ship they're so probably going is, to lose this in a, uh, in a landing for, test. You know, like, I don't want to 
They might not, but they're probably going to. If they were concerned about losing Starhopper in, a t in test that just goes up and down a couple hundred meters, then... So, it, 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 you know, launching sort of due east, you have to kind of uh, wait for the orbits to the, 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 the ground path to sync up with the launch site. And that's the only reason it really takes like, you know, maybe six hours or something like that to sync up and land back at Boca or the Cape. Um, the, you know, one of the really interesting, interesting things to, to contemplate is the total mass to orbit capability of a large reusable system where you have a significant fleet in operation. Um, the, you know, if, you have, if you've got something like Starship where you've got you know, maybe 150 tons capable to orbit um, and the ship can fly, is, is capable of say theoretically flying um, four times a day, but, but you know, they call it like 75% uptime, so theoretical three times a day uh, 365 days a year, so that's like about a thousand flights a year um, for the ship. The, the booster can do a lot more than that. Um, this is obviously max theoretical, um, and you've got, you know, 150 tons. That's sort of 150,000 tons to orbit per year per ship. Um, and if you've got say 10 ships, he's uh, you just. Have Spitballing right now. You're one and a half million tons to orbit. This is uh, not going um, to be happening next year. Tons to orbit year. I think the total That's one hundred percent for sure. Rest of world capacity. If you take all rockets on Earth, including Falcon, the total capacity to orbit, I think, is around two to three hundred tons currently. Total Earth capacity to orbit is about two to three hundred tons. If all rockets launched at max rate. Um, so we're talking about something that is, w w with, with a fleet of starships, a thousand times more than all Earth capacity combined. So all, all other rockets combined would be 0.1%, including ours. But you kind of need that if you're gonna build a city on Mars. So it's gotta be done, it's gotta be done. Keep in mind this, that Falcon 9 is designed for usability uh, once every 20 to 48 hours, and as of yet, they failed to um, do it more than once every three months, if memory serves correctly. regenerative uh, life support system. Um, so that, that just means you're recycling everything. Um, you know, that's for sure important uh, if you're on a several month journey to Mars and then uh, you're you know, on the surface for 18 months. Um, it, regenerative is a kind of a necessity. Um, so I, I don't think it's actually super hard to do that uh, relative to the the spacecraft itself, the life support system is pretty straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. Tell yeah, that to the Dragon 2 you've been struggling yeah, with for it's pretty straightforward. You're take out the water five vapor, years. Uh, CO2, convert that back to O2. Um, it's not, not super hard. Um, Though, to be fair, the life support system isn't the part you've been struggling with, the, it's the, the, the not killing people on it would not part. Have any people on board. It would just be in auto automatic mode. Uh, it would only be later flights or you know struggling to meet the, the to Mars, we NASA were requirement of probability of losing people on it that's what I meant by that yeah. take about two more questions uh, hi Elon Eric Berger with uh, Ars Technica um, I, I yay would say Eric the Dean was the coolest plane of all time um, it's not a plane, it's a rocket with, with wings. My question, I guess, is, you know, we're not really used to seeing hardware built in less than a year. Can you talk about the timeline for this vehicle, like, 
when you started fabricating it and how you went so quickly on it. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, actually, I'm not sure. I think like up until October last year, we were pursuing a completely different design. So it was really, um, I switched the design to steel, I think, yeah, for proxy, uh, maybe October last year. Um, and then it's like, okay, let's, so what's the fastest we can build a steel, you know, ship in Texas? Uh, and we got, I think we built it, built it in about four months or something. Um, maybe, maybe five months. Um, and then uh, th this, the ship, uh, I think we, we, I'm not sure exactly when we started building it, but yeah, probably maybe about four months ago that we started building the ship, maybe five. So it's been four or five months since we started building the ship from nothing, I think. Yeah, something like that. And how did you go so fast? Um, well, I, I have this mantra called, if the schedule's long, it's wrong. If it's tight, it's right. <laughs> yeah. And I just uh, basically um, just go rec recursive improvement on schedule um, and uh, say, uh, with feedback loop. Did this make it go faster? Uh, okay, if it didn't, we're gonna need to fix it. Um, if the design, if the design is, takes a long time to build, it's the wrong design. This is the fundamental thing. Over and over, it's, it's like the tendency is to complicate things. And I have another thing, which is like, the best part is no part. The best process is no process. It weighs nothing, costs nothing, um, can't go wrong. So. As obvious as that sounds, the best, the best part is no part. Like the, my, the, the thing I'm most impressed with in when I have the design meetings at SpaceX is what did you undesign? Undesigning is the best thing. Just delete it. That's the best thing. Yeah. Hey, Elon. Uh, Robin here from supercluster.com. My question is about potential fun synergy between SpaceX and your other projects. One, is there a concept for a Tesla ro Mars rover? Two, are you gonna be launching? Yeah, is there a concept already? Uh, well, actually, yes, uh, the Teslas will work on Mars, you know? The, if you can either, you can just drive them pretty much. Because um, electric cars don't need uh, oxygen, they don't need air. Uh, so you can just drive them around, no problem. Are you gonna bring a boring machine to the moon or Mars? I think that would be a good good idea. Me too. It, yeah, because <laughs> you, you could just like make like as much room as you want underground, and and you protect it from radiation and everything, and uh, you could probably use the materials for building, and, and you need to mine ice and dirt anyway. So why not? You know, totally. Thanks, Elon. And oh, uh, I don't believe you about the aliens. <laughs> I hope I hope I'm wrong. I mean, I hope they're like, I, well, if they are here, I hope they're nice. You know, uh, they haven't killed us yet, so they must be not that bad. All right, any other questions? Hi, Elon, I'm Martin Avenue from the uh, SpaceX subreddit. We crowdsourced a few questions. It sounds like I only have time for one, but oh well. Uh, I was wondering, <laughs> could you uh, elaborate on the number of engines that will be used for the boost back and entry burns on Starship and what the uh, dry landing weight of the super heavy will Oh yeah, so Starship wouldn't really. Uh, if, if, if the, 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 there's the 20 kilometer thing, which uh, you know is mostly uh, th th it's going to have three engines, you know. Um, but you only really need like either th two of them to work at any given point in time. Um, but but the ship, when it's in orbital operation, will will only need a tiny bit of impulse to deorbit. Like you only, it's, you need like a very tiny like. Less than five percent of the mass of the vehicle is needed to deorbit. Um, That's so not a tiny really percentage, engines, but um, okay. And the main thing is like trying to get the control. Like, how do you shut off the thrust precisely, r really precisely, so that you don't over or undershoot your target? You don't need five percent, um, to be honest. And, and, and then it's more uh, like one percent. So yeah. Um, for the booster, the booster has seven engines that gimbal. And then the, the rest, whether it's a total of 31 or 37, are fixed. Um, the, the the fixed engines would not be used for boost back. So the only the center seven would be used for for boost back. Um, and then I really want to try to avoid an entry burn, if at all possible, 
That would because I, I, I that that would no you you have to have a high the system has to be capable of, of a very high Q uh, entry in order to avoid um, an entry burn. But I think we might be able to make the booster buff enough that it you know it doesn't need an entry burn. Ho hopefully, so then it just needs a landing burn. Yeah. Be honest, I think that's actually doable. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. All right. All right. Good presentation. Learned some things. Uh, one of them being that he's way too optimistic with his schedules, but we already knew that. Um, I do like and believe his schedules with the unmanned stuff, but his timelines with the manned, that, that's completely unrealistic in my opinion. Um, but anyway, uh, I think I'm going to end it there. I wanted to play some stuff after this, but uh, it went on for too long. It's almost 11 here. It didn't help that they started an hour later than I thought they were going to. Yep, that's was at the end of that. So I'm going to cancel that. Had a little bit shot of Tim's face there for a second. Um, yeah. I was going to continue on after that, but, uh, it started late and went on longer than I thought it was going to, so I'm, I'm going to end it there. Um, I'll get that, I'll get both these streams, I think, I'll, I'll edit them together and I'll put, put it up on YouTube as one thing. So, Yeah. People who can't, who didn't watch it here, uh, can watch it there. And if you're on YouTube, hey, you're watching it now. So, right, I will see you next time. Uh, I'm not sure when the next time is going to be. Um, maybe tomorrow? Probably not. Um, yeah, I'll try for tomorrow. I'll try to do tomorrow. Um, no promises. And after that, um, probably not until the week. Well, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm not going to say anything at this point. Uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow night. And... Yeah. Is it alright?